Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm glad you're coming. Um, Tina and I are here. We're going to wait until we've had a chance for more people to join us before we get started. I think we've, we've all become rather Swiss in the way we pay attention to time now. We don't start the meeting until it's exactly the right time. All right, we have 22 guests so far. We have a few more than 50 who have, who have registered. So um, we're gonna wait a couple more minutes, not too long. All right, we're good, we're good. Well, welcome everybody to the Move Minneapolis webinar for today, which is called the Post-Pandemic Real Estate Strategies. Um, I'm here with my special guest, Tina Hoy. I'm going to go through um, a few slides and introduce you to Move Minneapolis, and then we'll jump right into our presentation. So um, Move Minneapolis is a nonprofit. Um, we're a transportation management organization, and we serve the city of Minneapolis with a very special focus on downtown employers and commuters. So we serve commuters all over the region. As you know, Minneapolis downtown is the economic engine of our state. And um, so we wanna make sure that all the folks coming in are reducing their transportation related pollution and emissions. Um, so we do that at Move Minneapolis by decreasing drive alone car, truck and SUV trips. Uh, very specifically, we consult with employers on commuter benefits, transit and shared mobility options by biking and walking and really helping with all things commuting. And most of our services are provided to companies and organizations at no charge. So if you're a downtown employer and you haven't worked with us yet, we would really love to hear with you, hear from you. So we keep track of transportation in and around the Twin Cities and help people all around our region make sustainable choices. Uh, besides the consulting I just mentioned, we offer year-round events for employers and commuters, including the famous Car Free MSP and our National Spring Transportation Summit. Last spring, we had 600 guests from across the country and a few from around the world to talk about this issue of sustainable commuting and sustainable transportation and how important it is for uh, reducing the impact of climate change and um, uh, bad, bad impacts on our health. We advocate for more sustainable transportation choices and keep track of emerging transportation technologies. Um, you may have heard of Transit Screen and Loom, um, the, the little app you can use to find your bus or your train uh, transit app. There's a bunch of apps coming. And then we have a new product locally called FlexPass. It's trying to give people more options. Some days they may choose to drive, other days they may wish to use transit. Uh, the University of Minnesota research project, developing a new product. It's very cool. And finally, we offer carpool assistance and registration for downtown ramps. Um, two days from now, one more quick housekeeping item. November 12th on Thursday, we're hosting another webinar. This time it's on transportation, fringe benefits and taxes. Ed Sturm and Tammy Eichmann from Deloitte, they're going to share the 2020 updates to the tax code, including the tax implications of telework. And so that's something we're all paying attention to. It's all new for us. Uh, registration for this webinar is on our website and it will be in the chat. So head over to the chat. Um, our website is moveminneapolis.org. And last thing before I introduce our speaker, uh, Move Minneapolis just published a comprehensive guide to remote work. If you haven't done so yet, please head over to our website and download a copy. In our research for the guide, we learned just how much companies can save by integrating telework into their commute routines. And as much as, much as we learned also about how much air pollution we can cut by driving to work less. So before we get started, um, please know that Move Minneapolis loves a good online conversation. Nothing is more boring than a one-sided webinar. 
Uh, I've known Tina for four years. I love this woman. She has so much knowledge and we really want everybody in the, in the webinar today to have a conversation. So please put your comments and your questions in the chat. Um, my colleague, Becky Alper is our, is our behind the scenes producer. She and I will be elevating things and uh, we'll do our best to, to uh, bring up your questions. And so let's frame this discussion. We know at Move Minneapolis, from all of the research we've done, everything we've heard, that about 75% of the people who are currently teleworking want to hold on to that flexibility post-pandemic. We also know that many businesses are suffering. And they're looking really hard at their bottom lines for savings. Business decisions are going to be fluid for many months, if not years, to come. One of the biggest costs businesses bear is office space. And today we are so lucky to have an amazingly knowledgeable office space expert in the room. So I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Tina Hoy. Um, Tina is a real estate broker and she helps organizations align real estate decisions with business goals. As president and principal of NTH, she's more than 30 years experience in the real estate market in the Twin Cities. Uh, she serves clients from small nonprofits like mine to large corporations. Uh, her recent clients include Ecolab, Health Partners, and the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra. Tina's industry and community leadership is evident in her board and committee service with Catholic Charities, the St. Paul Building Owners and Managers Association, and she was recently the board chair of the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce. Tina holds a BA and an MBA with a emphasis in finance from the University of St. Thomas. Tina, thank you for coming. We are so glad you could join us. Thanks, Mary. Yeah, and now we'll hand it over to Tina's screen. Yeah, so I'm gonna go off video so I can concentrate on the presentation. And like Mary said, she's gonna take care of watching the chat so we can intersperse any questions and we'll have time for questions at the end. So here we go. How's that look? I'm learning, learning how to do all this. So um, as Mary said, uh, Nelson, what used to be Nelson Tietzen Hoy, now NTH, we do two primary things. We do real estate transaction work. That's part of my role in the firm. Um, so representing tenants um, and owner users in acquiring real estate, in leasing, and so forth. We also manage design and construction projects for our clients. So that could be a tenant improvement project. You signed a new lease, you're going to move in, but there's lots of work to be done. We can manage that for you. Or it could be as comprehensive as building a new building ground up. Um, so, and anything in between. Uh, as Mary said, we have a wide variety of clients from very large ones to architects and lawyers and nonprofits and even some government work. We've done work uh, recently with the city of St. Paul and the city of White Park um, in the outstate area. I do wanna just say I am not an attorney. Uh, I know lots of great attorneys, but I am not one. Um, and as a result, nothing I talk about here should be in any means considered legal advice. Um, I am gonna focus on office space in these uh, discussions. Things are very different if you are a retailer or an industrial user or hospitality. So this, this is really about office space. So we'll move on. So I think everybody kind of knows what's been happening in terms of the impact of COVID-19 on office, office space and on the work world. You know, it's been varied. A lot of organizations have been pleasantly surprised by the success of working from home. I know at our office, it's gone very smoothly. Um, we miss being together because we enjoy each other's company, but it's working. Um, and a lot of employees are happy with the situation. I think Mary quoted a statistic that 75% want some form of this going forward. 
There was a recent article in the Business Journal that quoted a large law firm and said that billings have stayed at 90% of levels pre-pandemic. So that, that's pretty good for um, a measurement of how well this is working. When we all first got the order to go home, we all thought this was gonna be a short-term situation and that the response would be, well, we all need more space so we can all sit further apart and things like that. And I think that thinking quickly uh, became outdated. Um, it became clear that we were in this for the long haul and that the change wasn't gonna be more space, but it might be less space. Um, I think employees are gonna want flexibility to work from home full-time or part-time in the future when we're done with this. We're gonna need more meeting spaces in the office to do collaborative work that is perhaps better done in person than it is over Zoom. And the office is gonna to have to be a place where people want to come now, not a place they have to come. And so that might mean some changes, whether it's um, as simple as just brightening it up a little bit or adding some amenities. But I, I really believe having choice going forward is going to be the most important thing. Um, a good kind of example of this, there was a survey at US Bank. And what they came back with was 20% of the people wanted to be in the office full time, 20% wanted to be home full time, and 60% wanted to be on a hybrid. So that, that's not that different from what Mary had seen. But I do worry about some, ca some caveats. We're going into a long Minnesota winter. And you know when this first started, we were in March, we could see spring. We had a great, beautiful summer here in Minnesota. The isolation piece of this was manageable. We could sit on a patio. Mary and I have done that to have coffee. Um, but now as I look out my window and watch it snow and know those patios are closed, um, I think people are gonna feel a little differently a month from now, two months from now. Um, what's really unusual about this, it's not just a work experiment, but it's a personal experiment too. Having your children at home you know, for remote learning from school gives you a very different perspective on working from home. If, you, if you're a single person and you live alone, working from home may not be that attractive because you're alone. You know, you've got three kids you're trying to supervise. It's a very different situation. And I also wonder about when some people go back to work, if you are working from home, will you feel like you're not part of the team? So there's still lots of moving pieces. And I think the bottom line is we don't really know the long-term impacts. So from my perspective, rushing to a long-term real estate solution right now may not be advisable if you don't need to do that. Um, I still think flexibility is gonna be really important. I think telework is gonna still be a big part once we can go back to work. But every person is different, every organization is different, every job is different. And I don't think we can sort that out quite yet. So before we jump into, so what do you do with your lease? I thought I'd just give a few comments about commercial office leases. Um, they typically are longer term. They might be three years, five years, even 10 years or more. So you might have a very long commitment. Every lease is different. So even if you're, in the same building as another tenant, the terms of your lease may not be the same as your neighbors. So you shouldn't assume because, well, the guy next door to me did this, so I can do the same thing. Don't count on that. They are legally binding contracts. And sometimes there's financial guarantees associated with them that the landlord is counting on. The good news is terms can be changed before the lease expires with agreement by both parties. But like with any other contractual arrangement, there needs to be give and take on both sides. Um, last thing I would say here, the type of building ownership matters. So some people, Mary and I are both in the Young Quinlan building. We have a local owner who's very hands-on, you know them personally. 
other people may be in a building that's owned by someone halfway around the world, or they might be part of a real estate investment trust. Those different ownership structures and decision making may help or hinder what you can do if you want to make changes. Um, so it's good to know just where you stand in terms of who in fact actually owns the building. So the first thing I'd advise you to do is read your lease. First of all, do you even have a complete document with all the amendments? Depending on how long you've been there, there could be several. So you wanna make sure you start from the right spot. Having the initial lease, all the amendments, any side letters, things like that. You wanna look for important dates. Know when your lease expires. Do you have a right to renew? If you do, when do you have to give notice? Um, those notice dates are important. Your rights are something of value. You might have a right to expand or contract or terminate. Those have value to you and should not be overlooked, but you should understand them. Do they come with a price? When do you have to give notice? And you should look for that financial security. There might be a personal guarantee. There might have been a security deposit paid at the beginning of the term. Um, you wanna get all of those pieces out and understand them and then determine kind of where you are in the decision-making cycle. So if your notice date on a renewal is coming up in a few months, that's a very different spot in the cycle than if it's three years from now. So that's essentially step one. And that's certainly something if you need help, a firm like ours can help figure that stuff out. So there's probably a few different scenarios and I'll start with this one. If your lease has an imminent expiration and I'm defining that for today as 12 months or less, you should be thinking about flexibility and thinking short-term. You wanna buy time to sort out what the long-term impact of this pandemic is going to be on your business, on your employees, and not try and figure out it out in the middle of a Minnesota winter. There's nothing wrong with talking to your landlord about a short-term extension. I'd look at mid to late 2022 to say, hey, we're still figuring this out. The landlords are still figuring this out. And I don't think it's unreasonable in a lot of circumstances to ask for a reduction in your rate and say, look, we want to stay, you know, but we don't know what the long-term future is and see what they say. You know, it shouldn't have to be an antagonistic process. So if you, if you have a little more time on your lease, so say 12 to 36 months remaining, you wanna start still talking to your landlord. Know that the, you know, the landlords don't know what's gonna happen either. You know, they're just as worried as the rest of us. So having a dialogue with them to just kind of get a determination of their willingness to work with you on the long term. I know there's landlords downtown today that are approaching their, their good tenants, we'll say, you know, the financially stable ones, and say, look, let's let's extend this lease right now. Um, not everyone's rushing to do that, again, because of the uncertainty, but um, you may have a landlord that's open to that. Then I'd say evaluate what's important to your business and your employees post the pandemic. You know, does your business need your employees back? Do they want to be back? Are you going to try and work some hybrid model? But take the time to really study it and know what your employees need and what your business needs and not just rush to, well, we're sending everybody home and we're going to terminate our lease and I don't think that's a good long-term decision. Um, certainly surveying employees is one option you could do during that time. I would be careful how you craft a survey to employees. I would enlist your HR department for that. Um, but to get their input on what they're thinking about for the future. If you plan to have people work from home for an extended period of time or indefinitely after this, I'd certainly say take a look at the um, 
the guide that Mary was talking about for telework. There's a lot of good information in there. You know, everybody went home and put their computers on their kitchen table or their dining room table or in an extra corner in the bedroom. And that's not a long-term solution. If you're gonna have people working from home long-term, they need a quality environment like you would provide them at the office. Once you figure that out, it may mean you need less space. So now is a good, then would be a good time to approach your landlord about how to modify your space in exchange for a longer term. That's typically the trade-offs we see is you want something to change. You want to invest in your space. You want to reduce your space. Landlords like term. And so you work something out that says, look, we'll extend for five years, but we want to give back this portion of the space and we want some money to make some adjustments in these areas. And that, that is a perfectly reasonable way to approach things. If you have a long-term obligation, you know, so three plus years, everything I just talked about it still applies. You should still go through that exercise. However, it may be more difficult to find that balanced restructure. If you have a lot of term left, there isn't the motivation for the landlord to add term and let you out of something. But it doesn't mean you don't have the discussion. Maybe there, you know, maybe there's something in your lease that has value to the landlord. For example, you have a right to expand. Well, if you have a right to expand, that ties the landlord's hand to lease to someone else. Maybe you give that up. Um, you don't want to rush to do those kinds of things. Or maybe you have a termination option out a few years. And you're saying, well, rather than terminating a couple of years, I'll give that up if you let me reduce my costs now. So there's other things in the lease that have value besides just your rent. So it goes back to read your lease, understand what the options are. Um, but the longer the term, I think the more creative you're going to have to get and the more challenging it might be. So one thing folks have done in that situation is you can look at subleasing. Um, it's never a profitable endeavor, but it might make sense in certain circumstances. We are seeing more sublease space on the market nowadays, so there'd be lots of competition. Um, there should be a provision in the lease that tells you what you can and can't do under a sublease. And so you should know that there might be restrictions on who you can sublease to. Um, but stay in touch with your landlord. Um, sometimes the landlord will know of people interested in space in the building. And if they know you are in a situation where you could give back some space, there might be something that can be worked out. Um, it just will be more challenging. I think the important thing is though, stay in touch with the landlord, have a good relationship with them. Um, they can hopefully be a partner in this. And if they're not, well, good to know that too, if they're not gonna help you. So you can make decisions accordingly. Um, as you think about actual physical changes to your space, um, one thing you can find out is what the landlord's doing right now already to upgrade their cleaning and their HVAC systems. They might be using new filters or other systems. Um, it's really hard to make any changes to that that aren't essentially building wide. As an individual tenant, you're really relying on the base building system for HVAC, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. So um, some people are looking at perhaps building more private offices instead of the extensive kind of open office scenario we've been in. Um, you probably wanna think about 10 to $15,000 a piece to build those plus furniture. Um, it could be a very expensive alternative. Um, some folks are looking at using a little, some plexiglass to kind of separate some workspaces. Um, we're seeing that happen, you know, where people are in workstations that are relatively low. But, you know, as the health people keep telling us, none of that is a replacement for wearing a mask, social distancing, hand washing, all of the things we're doing already. But there are some things that you can do to your space to perhaps make it work a little bit better.
if you decide you want to make those changes, and again, I would do them in the context of a longer term lease and having the landlord help with some of that. If you need a building permit to do it, you're going to need an architect involved. Um, oftentimes the landlord has a building architect, someone who knows the building and can help with that planning at a reasonable expense. And I'd look for assistance from the landlord. Again, the landlord often has funds for improving space. Again, in the context of extending the lease, um, but funds can be available. Um, it may not be the cheapest financing you get, um, but it sometimes can be better from a tax standpoint. And I'm not an attorney or a CPA, but it's worth talking to your accounting folks to find out if that's a good way to go. So in summary, don't rush to make a decision if you don't need to. Too much is changing. And I believe we'll continue to change over the next six months. I think it was great news to hear that they're making progress on a vaccine, but at the same time, they're saying it's gonna be quite a while before it's fully distributed. So, um, you know, we're looking at this for a while. See if there's short-term options you can implement to avoid making a long-term decision right now. And consider your landlord to be a partner in this, not an adversary. So I have rambled on. Um, we'll see if folks have questions. I'll figure out how to come back on the video. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tina. That was really informative. Um, and I think you managed to address a lot of the unknowns really well um, with a variety of um, different strategies. What struck me the most was knowing what your lease looks like and having a relationship with your landlord. I mean, I when you start working for an organization and it goes on and on and on um, year after year, and then you lose track of those documents, that can mm -hmm. be a real problem. Yeah, especially if there's been a change in leadership yeah. in the organization and you have a long-term lease, you sign it and you forget about it often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wanna encourage our, our guests again, if there are questions, you can put them in the chat or the Q&A, we will bring them up. Otherwise I will continue to ask my questions. Um, and I'd like to start with, with the statement that you know it's possible that the era of commuting to an office every day is finished. You know, we won't know that for a while, but I think it's possible, um, at least for a big chunk of the workforce. And offices were changing before the pandemic. You know, we saw, um, you know, you'd get an office with 25 people in it and they would have an enormous party room with a beer fridge and, you know, donut serving spaces um, and not a whole lot of desk space, so, you know, people would come in and they'd find a desk wherever it was available or they'd have a desk, but it wasn't private. You know, what, what's gonna be the new norm? You know, what, what is your prediction? You, we're not gonna hold you to this, but knowing what you do about the trends prior to the pandemic, what's gonna happen after the pandemic? Well, you're right. We were seeing lots of spaces where the, the space allocated to the individual got smaller and more space got allocated to the group. Um, I think some of that will reverse a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, the, the benching kind of style where you're really elbow to elbow and face to face, um, people might be concerned about going forward because whether it's a pandemic or it's flu season, maybe we all just need a little bit more elbow room. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the amenity spaces, the night, there will be a time when we will be just fine all hanging out in the break room and having a donut. Yeah. And, you know, so we're social creatures and we want to, you know, to be able to interact with other people, maybe not every day, but I think we're still going to want those spaces where we can come together. Mm -hmm. And so you know, having, having, I wouldn't get rid of those spaces because nobody's going to use the break room because they don't want to get close to anybody. Right. Um, 
I think technology, you'll see people invest, doing some more investment in technology because if you are gonna adapt a hybrid model, there's gonna be times where half the group's in the office and half the group's at home, but you all have to coordinate and you might want some other technologies to do that besides everyone just sitting at their desk on Zoom. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. I, get, I get it. That's great. <laughs> um, Renee uh, in our audience asks, um, you mentioned the flood of sublease space available. Is any of that finding new occupants or is it too early to tell? I'd say it's too, well, it's a little early, um, but I have heard of folks who have said, well, maybe we want some space where our people can come together a little closer to their homes during this time. Mm -hmm. um, and so looking for some short-term options. So um, there might be some opportunities there, but if you don't need to sign up for real estate right now, it's, it's tough to say, well, let's just sign a new lease because we don't know what's going to happen. You know, I think yeah. real estate tends to be a long-term decision. And, um, you know, that's where maybe sublease space might be useful because it can be a short-term decision often with sublease space. So that mm -hmm. might give it some appeal for some users. If you have a landlord that says, look, I'm not willing to work with you. You know, you're going to yeah. stay here and you're going to pay higher rent and you're going to keep all your space. Well, sublease might be a good transition mm -hmm. to figure out what, what the future holds. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, one of our attendees has a question. It's, it's a good long one. Um, a healthy downtown Minneapolis is important for our region. Even before the pandemic, downtown was a pretty sleepy place outside of the nine to five office hours and large events. Uh, could this be an opportunity to convert office buildings or parking ramps into housing or other uses to boost downtown's vibrancy? That's a that's an interesting question. You know, it is it does sometimes feel like downtown, you know, with the with the I would say failure of retail um, has changed so much. And and I'm old. I was hanging around downtown in the 70s and 80s, and it was quite a fun place to be. Um, it's still fun, but in a different way. How you know are would turning a lot of office towers into um, residences even be possible? And if so, would that create vibrancy? Um, I'll start with the, is it possible? I'd say in some circumstances, yes, you're seeing that happen right now, downtown St. Paul. Mm. Uh, there are several. Yeah, good point. That um, at one point were office space that are now um, residential or being turned into residential as we speak. So again, depending on the specific nature of the building, there certainly may be opportunities to do that. Turning a parking ramp might be a little more challenging, although I know as some of the newer ramps people have designed, perhaps with the thought they could be converted to something else. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I haven't actually seen that happen. But with office space, I have. Um, People downtown, people living and working downtown, that creates the vibrancy. So if the, uh, if the buildings aren't filled with office workers, if they're filled with residents, that's still a good thing and I think would be a positive. I mean, we've had lots of residential built downtown and it's been quite successful and until recently when mm -hmm. there's been some hiccups, but um, having more people downtown would absolutely be fabulous, whether it's during the day or at night. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm thinking of the ABC ramps, which are owned by MnDOT um, on the west end of downtown. Mm -hmm. And they did a study a couple years ago, um, pretty wide ranging on potential reuses and updates to those ramps. And one of the outcomes was um, at least one of the ramp structures could be covered. They weren't talking about um, transforming the parking decks, I don't think, because they still have the, the drainage issues of mm -hmm. you know, when you build a parking deck, it's, it's rarely flat. 
but they were looking at building uh, workforce housing on top of the ramp, you know, multiple levels. And that's, that's a fascinating idea. Mm -hmm. um, David, David has a question here. Can you please provide a perspective on co-working environments such as WeWork and others? Will there be a reset, a retrenchment or a rebound? Oh, I'll pick reset. Um, my, you know, I have not officed in one, but I have visited several of them. And the model of, you know, six people in a 10 by 15 space, I think mm -hmm. is a tough one um, in the under current circumstances, but it still is a good model for that you might use it in a different way. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a spot for your telework people to collaborate. So I live in the East Metro. My office is downtown Minneapolis. We're a small firm, so it doesn't really matter. But if there were 10 of us out here teleworking, it might be nice to have a spot like that to come to rather mm -hmm. than all of us driving or taking the bus to yeah. downtown downtown Minneapolis. Yes. So I, th I think there is there is still a need for that type of flexible it has very short term commitments, which again, is hard to find lots of times with real estate. Um, and so I think it's still part of a solution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for firms going forward. I think it, it, it provides that um, personal connection, again, that you're not going to have if you're working at home by yourself because now the kids are back in school and mm -hmm. all of a sudden your house is quiet. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That was a question. Um, if, you know, we're, we're working, we're, we're remote working now in a pandemic. Our children are underfoot. Um, if, we, if we're caring for our elderly parents, you know, sometimes their helpers are not available anymore. Mm -hmm. Things are really stressful. You know, once the pandemic ends, and it will end sometime in the next couple of years, we have, to, or at least it will be manageable. How, how do we look at our, our residential locations? I mean, this, this fascinates me. Someone keeps telling me um, that people don't like telework because their communities are boring. There's yeah. nothing to do. You know, it, you you can't get anywhere without a car. Um, of course, everything's closed. When it opens up again, I mean, I predict, Mary predicts that we're going to have a flood of new business establishments. I mean, there is going to be all of this pent up demand. All of these entrepreneurs, um, as far as I know, capital still available. Will small towns like will. Will Hopkins, St. Louis Park, um, you know, um, I'm thinking of the other actual bedroom communities, uh, White Bear Lake, they have downtowns. Will these places explode because people can now telework a few days a week? They'll be going to their downtown businesses. Often they have even slightly walkable downtowns. Um, what, this is kind of a bigger question. This is more of yeah. a question. How, if your town is fun, if you can walk somewhere, instead of having to drive everywhere. Wouldn't anyone just wanna take their laptop over to the local coffee shop and hang out and do their work a couple days a week? And maybe a couple days a week, yeah. I look forward to going back downtown because that's the coffee shop I go to. And, you know, mm -hmm. you know, I, there is really not a place I can walk to from my house that's you know, with, I'll say within a mile where I could get a cup of coffee. So I'm going to get in my car if I want a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, but if say you live in Hopkins, well, Hopkins is still a big place. Are you still hopping in your car to go to downtown Hopkins? Right. You know, so, but maybe you can hop on your bike when the weather's nice. This is the electric bike person in me who's about to jump in the conversation, but that's not our topic today. I well, I, you know, I am not a residential real estate person, mm -hmm. so, but things I have heard, you know, some people looking to move further away from downtown because they can remote work. Right. And they're just worried about the commute or wanting a different 
house because if they're going to do more remote work, they need a place that's a real office and not just hijacking the dining room table. Yeah. Um, and, you know, everything you read, the residential market's really hot, that they can't keep up with demand. Mm -hmm. So if you were thinking to make a change personally, it'd be a good time to look at it. Um, yeah. you know, but I am not in the residential market on a day-to-day -day basis. But, mm -hmm. but I think long-term, it might, might prove some interesting changes to where people choose to live. Mm -hmm. Because if you can work from anywhere, then you can live anywhere. As long right. as it's got a good internet connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Joseph asks, do you see the demand for office space to increase in the suburbs versus the city? I think long-term, what attracts people to the city is the density, the access to the other businesses, the retail, the restaurants, the nightlife, that once we're through this, I think that's still going to be important. Um, the benefit of the suburbs is the ease of driving, uh, the shorter commutes perhaps, if you're living at the right end of things. Um, but they've historically had challenges attracting from a broad work pool because there isn't the public transportation. And those kinds of things I don't see changing. Mm -hmm. There's certainly people tire kicking in the suburbs right now. Um, and why wouldn't you? But I think those fundamentals aren't going to change. So if you're an employer that really wants to attract a young and active workforce, downtown is still going to be a good option for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my boss, Jonathan Weinhagen, thank you for the question. With a future where employees aren't one, oh, in the office every day, which we anticipate, is the monthly parking contract dead? Hmm, that sounds like a question for me. How should employers think about that benefit now and moving forward? Well, that's a, that's a great question because I've always, you know, been involved with transportation. That's the biggest frustration. Until recently, I lived somewhere where I had an easy walk to a light rail station. And I would take it on a nice day once in a while. But mm -hmm. I still had a monthly parking contract, so I'm paying for both. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're working on with the U now is something where I can drive some days, I can ride some days. Mm -hmm. And if, if that had been available five years ago, I would have been all over it. I think from you know, managing parking, that will be a challenge, I think. The monthly contract's a lot cheaper than 30 days of daily parking. And so for both the purchaser and the ramp manager to find that balance of getting the economics right. Mm -hmm. it, we'll take some figuring out, but I think, I think it would be great to have a system where you could have a partial monthly contract. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the um, university professor who is working on this is Yingling Fan, and uh, she's working with MnDOT and uh, everybody, pretty Metro Transit, Move Minneapolis, a whole group of folks. And you know, if they're, they're studying um, two different passes, one where you would have uh, 10 days of, of parking per month and the other 14 days of parking. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately the pandemic has, has bollocked up the study a little bit because not a whole lot of people are traveling downtown right now. Um, but they did manage to do all of the structural work. So they've got the you know, the entry, the ramp entry pass working, and it's talking to the Metro Transit buses and trains. Um, it's, it's, they've, they've cracked a number of the problems and hopefully they will be able to get it figured out because I agree with you, Tina, some folks will want to, I mean, I think we're gonna see people using transit some days, biking some days, working from home some days. Um, mm -hmm. we've, we've discovered flexibility and once you've, offered flexibility to people, they are not going to get it back very easily. And, and different jobs have different requirements. The work I do in commercial real estate throughout the Twin Cities, I have to be often in three or four different parts of the Metro in the same day. And right. so that's hard to do without a car. Yeah, there are certain, certain but um, folks who can, can never do this. 
But there can be days where I know I'm going to be downtown all day. I might not be in the office all day, but I'm downtown all day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Transit works for a day like that. Right. Um, I have another question. This one is about back to our heating, ventilation, and air conditioning uh, changes. How can individual tenants make sure these crucial public health measures happen? Should they band together with other tenants in the same building? Well, you should go together to your landlord and say, what are you doing? And what can be done with the systems that we have? Um, yeah, it, it's not the kind of thing you can do something for one tenant that you're not doing for another tenant. The systems general, generally don't work that way in a multi-tenant office building. Mm -hmm. If you're in an industrial building, a lot of times the systems are separate space by space. But um, if you're in IBS, you got to talk to IBS about what they're doing. And from my experience, landlords know their tenants want these things and they want to do what's best for their tenants. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. That. So here's another question from me. I have never worked with a commercial designer or an architect in, in terms of building out um, office space. Can you lay out more, I, I guess, step-by-step step for me, if you, if you don't want to change anything about your lease, but you do want to change your space, who do you call first? I mean, after you've talked to your landlord, is it an architect or is it a designer? Um, or do you, is it like design build? You can call a, a, a builder and they can do it all in-house. I, I, I know about residential, but nothing about commercial. Yeah. If, if, it's, if you're thinking small changes and you don't have an existing relationship with some type of interior designer and or architect, then I would start with the landlord and say, is there someone, are there some approved folks you've worked with? Mm -hmm. um, and start there. Um, There's certainly lots of firms in town that do great work. Um, but if for a, a small project, working with the building's architect who knows the building and the systems and mm -hmm. what the landlord expects is a good place to start. If, you, if you've got a more wholesale project where um, you're gonna completely redo everything, well then I think, then you wanna hire us. Yeah. And our project manager will help you through that process. How's that? <laughs> I, yeah, I think that's, that's a great answer. And Let's do a little more advertising for you here because your firm is really unique. Can you can you talk a little bit more about what kinds of capacity you have on your team? Yeah, so as I, I said at the beginning, we both do transactional work, real estate brokerage, and we do design and construction management. And the nice part about having those two skill sets is we often work together uh, to help our clients make good decisions. So when a client says, you know, our lease is coming up, our space doesn't work anymore, we want to be in a different part of town. You know, on my side of the equation, you know, identifying spaces, negotiating leases, things like that. But my project management partners are saying, okay, well, of these options, this one's going to cost you X number of dollars to create what you want. This one's going to cost Y. And knowing the difference between the spaces and what's what's going to impact those budgets mm -hmm. brings all of those pieces together for decision making. So not just, wow, this is really cheap rent, but well, it's cheap rent, but it's going to cost you twice as much to move in. And when all is said and done, this other option might've been better. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we can help people sort through that, really think about what their long-term business strategy is and how the real estate can support that. Um, it's not just about, well, I have 5,000 square feet today and I want a little more, so let's do six. It's like, well, no, no, no. How are you working today? And that's where bringing a designer in fairly early in the process can help too if you want to make changes to say, what is the right amount of space for you going forward? Do you want to make some functional changes? If you're heavily private office, are you willing even in these circumstances to do more open space or vice versa? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of decisions to be made um, that can really support your business. You know, if you, people will hopefully be coming to work there regularly. You want it to be a place that's inviting, that helps you 
attract talent, helps you keep good talent. Um, the office, the quality of the space, I think will become more important going forward. If you're paying for it, you want people there using it. Yeah. You want it a place people want to be. Yeah. Instead of like, oh, I don't want to go to the office. I'll just stay home today. Um, nice. Because there's, there's value in us being together and working together. We do have fun. Our team has fun. Um, Danielle requests, um, since making real estate decisions right now is so uncertain, what can I do now to start preparing to be ready to make good decisions when the time comes? Um, understand what is working now about teleworking. Presumably you're doing that with a large part of your staff. Um, so really seeing is, are, are people thriving? What are people's challenges? What are their challenges gonna be six months from now? Um, and thinking that through now, before you have to make a decision, I think would be good. Mm -hmm. uh, you could test some things. Um, you know, as we start to open up a little bit, you know, if there's folks in the office that want to try a hybrid model, experiment. Um, there's nothing wrong with trying things, see how they work um, when we're ready to. Yeah. I think yeah. the governor is still saying if you can work from home, you're supposed to work from home and there'll be new restrictions announced this afternoon. So we'll wait with bated breath for yeah. those. <laughs> oh my, Britain, thank you for this comment. Um, Britain says, I work for a small design firm in Minneapolis. And after six months of working from home, our office used the monetary savings of not being in the office and distributed to the staff as a summer bonus. Oh, nice. Fantastic. You think about, think about all, I mean, you have rent, obviously, um, desk space if you're adding the staff, uh, cleaning, heating, ventilation, air conditioning costs. What are the, if you, how much can you save? Um, well, that's tricky because the building still that you're in is probably still heated and cooled and cleaned. You know, all of those services are still happening even though there's very few people in the building. I don't know really any larger buildings that have just been completely shut off, mm -hmm. um, but those circumstances might exist. Um, but I know for us, we're saving on parking. Oh yeah, parking and, and sadly MetroPass. The yeah, you know, we're not all, taking clients to lunch and doing all of those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, you know, we're seeing real savings in our budget. I, I am truly curious how much we spend on the beer fridge and uh, coffee. <laughs> 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 Who knows? Yeah, so I mean, some of that stuff around the edges, if, you know, th there have been people that have gone to their landlords and said, look, we need, we need a break. Um, mm -hmm to get through this uh, it's been a lot more in the retail yeah. area yeah. too, and you know that savings is meaningful and the fact that they gave it to their employees is pretty remarkable yeah. i yeah. wonder if that could become a norm well and to think about you know how do you compensate employees working from home on an ongoing basis with one client kind of speculating about how they might do that and do they provide an allowance for some equipment at home and mm -hmm. um, coverage of their internet to make sure they have good service and things like that. So I don't think you can send people home and say, oh, done, don't have to pay anything now. I think you're right. going right. to do it long term. I think you have to take it very seriously. And invest yeah. In at well, Minneapolis, of course, we are going to have to put our money where our mouths are. And we have budgeted for next year to, uh, to account for some of those employee costs. And this is another reason I think people might be interested in our Thursday webinar uh, about taxes and how, what are the tax implications of telework for both the employer and the employee. You know, it, some, some contractors, people who work from home, they can use IRS formulas and write off, you know, big chunks of that that may not apply to telework. So um, the, 
minneapolis.org is where you can uh, register for that free webinar or it's also in the chat. Maybe Becky can pop it back in the chat again. Um, so I just got uh, an email this morning or I opened it up this morning. It's from Cushman and Wakefield and the title of the email was, do amenities still matter? So my question is what's most important to office workers? Is it a beautiful conference room or a big private office or a fancy break room or none of the above? Is really the only, is the only important thing that they go to their office, they see people they really like and enjoy, that they're warm and dry, and uh, that they're doing good work and they feel uh, appreciated by their boss. I mean, I, I was speaking with my colleague this morning, talking about one of my first jobs in a church in South Minneapolis. We were, it was KFAI, a radio station, and we there were three of us, the director, I was the fundraising lead, and then we had an assistant, all three of us tight in this little tiny office in a church. The heat wouldn't work in the winter. There were 70 or so volunteers who were cycling in and out, hanging out with us. We were absolutely on top of each other, but we loved each other and we loved what we did. That space didn't matter. Um, what really matters? Tina, you're on the spot. Oh. I think, right, I think the environment does matter. And that environment includes the people. Um, you could have the most beautiful space in the world, but if your coworkers don't all get along, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So I think having both a, a space that is attractive and supports people in their work. So not too noisy when you need heads down work and privacy when you need privacy and flexibility, but also obviously having leadership that supports the staff and builds collegiality. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be a place you want to be because you like the people and you like the space. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to put out the last call for questions from our audience. Um, thank you, Becky, for putting up the, the log in or the sign in for our Thursday tax webinar. That's in the chat. Um, I have really enjoyed this conversation. It's something I've wanted to talk about since the beginning of the pandemic. And as we continue to help employers work through their telework challenges and um, develop sustainable transportation and commuting programs, uh, I thank all of you for attending today. I, I feel like none of this is in anyone's hands. A lot of this is outside of our control, but we are doing as best a job as we can to create solutions and strategies so that we can both breathe easier and prevent the worst effects of climate change, develop a beautiful community, um, have a vibrant downtown. Um, Tina, I can't thank you enough. This has been fantastic. That was fun. Thank you for inviting me. All right. Bye, everybody. See you Thursday. Bye-bye.